So when I was invited uh, to take part in this uh, workshop or conference, so my idea was uh, to uh, share with you some of my <coughs> uh, hypotheses, some of questions I asked uh, myself, uh, because as you know, in the uh, last six years, uh, Ukraine is coming through very uh, dramatic time of troubles with uh, many uh, disasters, uh, political, military, social, economic, etc. So, uh, and uh, actually, it's maybe not a classical lecture, but rather a set of questions I am addressing to myself and I am addressing to you to uh, discuss all together. So, uh, maybe the main point of uh, mine uh, today is uh, that uh, Ukrainian Cossack, uh, Cossack myth, as we know it, uh, was uh, reflect uh, this stateless period of Ukrainian history, 19th, most of the 20th century, but for the last 30 years we are living in independent Ukraine, uh, which is a nation state, and so this old style Cossack myth has to be revised, reinterpreted, or maybe even reinvented. So I shall uh, I shall start <coughs> so uh, maybe we change a little bit because it's uh, one and a half the next page. So I shall start with uh, events of 1990 uh, when there was this uh, famous campaign celebration of 500 years uh, anniversary of Ukrainian Cossack Dome of Zaporozhian host and uh, so maybe some of you uh, remember or read this um, excellent paper of Karel Berghoff Brothers, we are all of Cossack stock the Cossack campaign in Ukrainian newspapers <coughs> on the eve of independence so it was in 1990 and Actually, he used this line from Ukrainian national anthem, Ipokazhen Shonobratya Kozakskova Rodu, but uh, in English translation it transformed into Brothers, we are all of Kozak stock. So, actually, uh, why I uh, begin from that line? Because uh, initially it was idea of this uh, Narodny Ruch leadership of Ukrainian political opposition to, Ukra to unite uh, Ukrainians, Ukrainian speaking, Russian speaking Ukrainians around this idea of uh, Cossack heritage, of Cossack descent. So, brothers, we are all of Cossack stock. And actually, uh, then I shall try to show uh, uh, did this effort was successful or not. So, uh, since I got one hour for my lecture, so I'm planning to uh, discuss such topic as uh, eclecticism of the Cossack myth in post-Soviet Ukraine, then comparison of the Cossacks in Russia and Ukraine, I mean in last 30 years, ambivalence of the eclectic Cossack myth in present-day Ukraine, imperial dimension of the Cossack myth, the Cuban Cossacks and Ukraine, the Crimean Cossacks, the Cossacks in the military conflict in Donbas, triumph and erosion of the Cossack myth in contemporary Ukraine, and finally, if I will have a little more time, commodification of the Cossack myth and deconstruction of the Cossack myth. 
So just to show you this uh, enthusiasm in the 1990 when this uh, anniversary of the 500 years of Ukrainian Cossack Dome was organized and it was organized by the Narodny Ruch Ukraini. So maybe some of these uh, people still alive and the many groups activists from different parts of Ukraine came together in the city of Zaporizhia full of uh, enthusiasm, expectations, so with some weapons and with some interesting slogans we are going to be not the Muscovites but the Cossacks Nepidem of Moscali, Apidem of Kozaki so defining the choice between independence and renovated USSR as it was proposed by Mikhail Gorbachev. So in the 90s and 2000s, some Ukrainian politicians and historians frequently claimed that only the Kozak myth can unite all the regions of Ukraine together. They reasonably considered the glorification of the Oonupa as too much radical and alliant to be adopted in southeastern Ukraine. Therefore, the spread of the Kozak myth to southeastern Ukraine was considered as more realistic and helpful to promote their Ukrainian identity. Southeastern Ukraine was considered as too much russified and affected by the Soviet historical myth. The Kozak myth had to replace the Soviet myth and thereby reintegrate southeastern regions with western and central parts of Ukraine. And now, uh, I will show you two images uh, to show what happened in 2014. Did this expectation work or not? So here you see a Kiev Maidan in winter 2014 and a group of Cossack horsemen actually uh, acting as a performance, giving some uh, uh, a sort of historical pepper to this uh, big political event. But there were also other Cossacks, for instance, Don Cossacks in the Crimea blocking the road between Simferopol and Sevastopol in the early March 2014 with very uh, speaking uh, inscription Banderlogi Nepraidut. So in that case the Cossacks are opposed to the Banderids from Western Ukraine. So here we see that in case of uh, Crimean Peninsula, in case of <coughs> Southeastern Ukraine, particularly in case of Donbas, this uh, Cossack myth was not so much effective in 25 years to <coughs> uh, work in the direction of nation state making, but Cossack myth in Crimea and Donbas was used in opposite direction uh, to do uh, harm to Ukraine, to destroy its territorial integrity. So actually I shall try to uh, ask these questions to myself and to all of you why it happened. Yeah. One point of mine is eclecticism of the Cossack myth in post-Soviet Ukraine. The Cossack myth was elaborated in early 19th century memoranda composed by the descendants of Ukrainian Cossack elite who petitioned the Tsar for granting them equal rights with Russian noblemen. Finally they became Malorossiskaya Dvaryanstva. So actually it's very uh, nice described by Sergei Plohi in his uh, monograph, The Cossack Myth. Then the image of the Cossack freedom fighters addicted to the orthodox faith and Russian Tsar was further developed in the Romanticism and promoted after oppression of the Polish uprising of 
1840, and Nikolai Gogol was one of the most famous <coughs> in that case. While in Russian imperial myth, the Cossacks were loyal servants of the dynasty and church. And again, you see this example of performance. Many enthusiast political activists of this national revival, they like to be dressed in this old Cossack style. In the Soviet historical narratives, the Ukrainian Cossacks were busy with the anti-feudal struggle before 1654 and then assisted the Russian army against Poles, Swedes, Turks and Tatars. At the same time, the Ukrainian diasporas in North America and Western Europe developed myth of the Cossacks as the founders of the Ukrainian statehood and fighters against Russian and Polish colonialism. All these myths were mixed together in the 90s in a strange cocktail. In that mix, all the Cossacks were declared the heroes for present-day Ukrainians, despite the fact that many of them fighted each other, being on the service of the competing empires. The next point is ambivalence of that eclectic myth became evident in course of the crisis in 2014, when the Cossack hosts and Cossack mythologems were employed by the anti-Ukrainian forces in the Crimea and Donbas. Thereby, the eclectic myth shaped in the stateless period is out of date in contemporary Ukraine and must be revised in accordance with the nation-state realities. So, then the next point is official commemorations, elections and interstate relations. So, I will show you how Ukrainian politicians began to use Cossack myth for their political purposes, mostly for getting electoral support. I shall start with a series of battles, Zhovtivo, the Korsun, Pilavci, won by the Cossacks of Bogdan Khmelnytsky in 1648. In the Soviet narratives, these battles were interpreted as part of the anti-feudal war for the Finno reunification with Russia. After 1991, the battles were reinterpreted as part of the national revolution and Ukrainian nation-state building. Because the acting president, Leonid Kuchma, shifted his basic electorate from southeastern to western Ukraine in the eighth of upcoming presidential elections of 1999, the 350 years anniversary of the battles were officially celebrated in 1998 to get support of the voters traditionally voting for the National Democrats. The next event, next example, quite good to show the dynamics, how the same anniversary, the same celebration of the same event could be used for political purposes and then be put into oblivion. For instance, joint Polish-Lithuanian army and Ukrainian Cossacks defeated the joint Ottoman-Tatar army in September 1621 near the fortress of Hotin, thereby stopping the invincible Ottoman expansion in Europe. In 1991, the 370-year anniversary was celebrated mostly on the local level in Chernivtsi Oblast as part of the recovery of Ukrainian history where the Cossack myth played a central role. Then the battle was seen as an example of Polish-Ukrainian cooperation instead of the stereotype of eternal rivalry and hatred in Polish-Ukrainian relations, an image for a long time promoted in Russian-Soviet historical meta-narrative. What happened 10 years later, in 2001, the celebration of 380-year anniversary of the Battle of Hotin got new additional meaning and scale. After the political scandal around the <coughs> murder of Ukrainian journalist Gongadze, President Leonid Kuchma was accused by political opponents of being involved in the murder. Then Kuchma was isolated 
in the international arena. Not one of, no one of foreign state leaders visited Ukraine. Under such circumstances, commemoration of the battle was seen in Kuchma's entourage as a good pretext to invite Alexander Kwasniewski, president of Poland, as a celebration of the battle will glorify the joint victory of two nations. Poland, which recently joined NATO, represented itself as a lawyer of Ukraine and Europe. Thus, visit of Polish president could interrupt international isolation of Kuchma. The scale of commemoration was changed dramatically. In a short time, a huge amount of money was allocated from the state budget for archaeological excavations in the fortress, its restoration and preparation for the celebration. Unfortunately for Kuchma, Kwasniewski ceased his visit in the last moment. Nevertheless, Kuchma took part in the celebration. And then, ten years after, in 2011, the celebration of the battle declined to the local event celebrated by a governor of Chernivtsi Oblast. So I think it's quite a good example of this dynamic change, how one <coughs> event could be used in different ways. Then, uh, uniting or dividing, competing commemorations of the battles of Poltava and Konotop in the summer 2009. The commemorations, let me remind, took place between two important political events. The second Russian-Ukrainian gas war in January 2009 and upcoming presidential elections in Ukraine in January 2010. So, and the Battle of Paltava was and is one of the most controversial events in Ukrainian history, for sure used by politicians. In the Russian Empire, the anniversary of the battle was among major state-organized celebrations in 1809 and 1909. The decline of the Soviet historical mythology during Perestroika stimulated Russian nationalists to rediscover the greatness of Russian past. In summer 1989, Young Russia organization intended to visit Poltava and to reenact the battle. Recently founded Oppositional Narodny Ruch Ukraine opposed this commemoration and prevented the visit <coughs> of Russian activists to Poltava. Thus, Ruch demonstrated that the victory of Poltava is foreign commemoration and that Russia and Ukraine have different historical narratives, different past and different future. This story was repeated in 2009 when 300 300-year anniversary of the battle was turned into a symbolic act of distancing Ukraine from Russia. Ukraine rejected idea of common commemoration of the battle, but allowed Russian official delegation, which included Sergei Narishkin, a chief of the presidential administration of Russia, and Viktor Chernomyrdin, a former ambassador to Ukraine, to commemorate this event. In response, Yuri Lushkov, the mayor of Moscow in 1992-2011, known as the most persistent Ukrainophobe, on 9 August 2009 organized reenactment of the Battle of Poltava in the Museum Reserve Kolominskaya in Moscow. Re the reenactment was played by some reenactor clubs stunt performers and soldiers, altogether 800 persons. During the commemoration in Kolomenskaya, Lushkov recited his own poem <laughs> in which he accused the Ukrainian president Yushchenko of being contemporary Mazepa, that is the traitor of the eternal friendship of the fraternal Slavic nations, Russians and Ukrainians. In Poltava, the commemorations were complicated because of strife between a governor and a mayor, representatives of two rivalry parties, presidential Our Ukraine, <coughs> National Ukraine, and Prime Minister's Yulia Tymoshenko bloc, respectively. Several days in advance, the far-right party Svoboda decorated the streets of Poltava with about 70 billboards with a portrait of Mazepa and motto 
Mazepa won Ukraine is independent. Then the billboards were dismounted in accordance with unofficial decision of Poltava's city council. Initially, there was a plan of the battle reenactment elaborated by the reenactor clubs from Ukraine, Russia, and Europe, but because of the political quarrels on the international and local level, the reenactors refused to take part in. According to a head of one Ukrainian club, the reenactors will not contribute to the cheap provincial show organized by Poltava's pro Russian mayor. As well, they dislike the martyrological scenario of a total sorrow proposed by the official ideologues of Kiev. As a consequence, on 27 June 2009, up to 13,000 spectators saw a heavy footed imitation of a fight by several dozens of actors dressed as Russian and Swedish soldiers and Cossacks. <coughs> A monument of Charles XII sent by a sculptor from Sweden to be erected on the battlefield was rejected by the city council and museum of the Battle of Poltava. Finally, it found its place in the museum of Poltava Oblast. A monument to Mazepa was rejected by the mayor of Poltava. Then it was erected on the cathedral square of Poltava only in 2016. On, July, uh, on 11 July 2009, there was a commemoration of another <coughs> important battle, 350th anniversary of the Battle of Konotov. In this battle, Cossack army of Hetman Ivan Wychowski, with assistance of his Tatar and Polish allies, defeated the Russian army near the town of Konotop in 1659. <coughs> The commemoration of this battle was organized on the highest level with personal participation of President Yushchenko. There was no reenactment of the battle, only the Cossack horse riding show and concert of folk music. The commemoration of Konotop was seen by its organizers as the alternative to commemoration of the Poltava battle. So it both commemoration took place in July, in the same month. Naturally, in Russia, the commemoration of Konotop was seen <coughs> as an inimical act of Ukrainian government in relations between the two countries. Then the next point, comparison of the Cossacks in post-Soviet Russia and Ukraine. So actually, it's quite interesting question, who are these people? calling themselves Cossacks or identifying themselves as Cossacks. I just tried to make some preliminary comparison and I hope that some of anthropologists, historians, political scientists will do more grounded uh, research in the future. Who are the Cossacks in Russia? Right-wing, conservative, clerical, anti-Western, anti-liberal, cooperate with ruling party, Yedinaya Rasiya, never question Russian statehood and territorial integrity. Who are Cossacks in Ukraine? I have no answer. I have uh, no idea about common platform. How can I identify these people? The main idea of the current Russian Cossack myth the Cossacks were always on the service of Russian state, colonizing new areas and defending Russia's borders. Cossack myth is absolutely secondary to the basic Russian myth of Russian statehood, territorial expansion and competition with the West. Cossacks in Russia pretend to restore their traditional way of life or at least some traditions lost after Socialist Revolution of 1970. When Cossacks in Ukraine pretend to restore their traditional way of life lost after 1775, which is quite fantastic. Then the next point, ambivalence of the eclectic Cossack myth in contemporary Ukraine, particularly in the politics. <coughs> Just let me remind that the Cossack myth has another dimension, imperial dimension, because 
uh, and I think we will have uh, papers devoted particularly to this uh, topic, so I will uh, restrict myself just to a few sentences. So Cossacks and particularly uh, Cossacks of Kuban who pretend to be descendants of Zaporozhian Cossacks, where they were also in favor of uh, Russian Romanov ruling dynasty and even more in uh, uh, Russian Empire and then in Soviet Union uh, there was uh, alternative image of Cossacks elaborated like uh, these uh, images from the famous Soviet movie Vicherana Hutare Blitz Dikanki so I think that many in Ukraine when they hear the word Cossacks they will recollect these images particularly the older generation Cossacks as maybe Ukrainian Cossack as not very smart people, but loyal servants of the Catherine the Great on, of Russian throne, fighting against Turks and Tatars, etc., etc. So, and uh, how it works still now. For instance, the last example. In August 2019, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky officially gave the name of Ivan Sirko to one of Ukrainian military detachments. So Ivan Sirko, the Koshevoy Ottoman of the Zaporozhian host, the first biography of Ivan Sirko was written by Dmitro Yavornitsky in 1890. Russian painter Ilya Repin immortalized Ivan Sirko in his famous painting Reply of the Zaporozhian Cossacks to the Ottoman Sultan, finished in 1891. The monument to Ivan Sirko was erected in Kharkiv in August 2017. But if we will take a closer look, we will see some contradictions. For instance, during the civil war in the Hetmanate Ukraine, Ivan Sirko frequently switched sides, however, keeping a loyalty to the Russian Tsar. When in 1658, the Hetman Ivan Vyhovsky disrupted his loyalty to Russia in order to save political autonomy of the Hetmanate as a member of tripartite Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, Ivan Sirko fighted against Vyhovsky and his ally, the Crimean Khan. In the independent Ukraine, the hetman Ivan Vyhovsky is celebrated as one of the founding fathers of Ukrainian statehood, the Cossack Hetmanate. Then why Ukrainians should celebrate his enemy, Ivan Sirko? He was of pro-Russian orientation. And the next contradiction, so you will find much more, but I just give these two examples. Anton Holovaty, a member of the Cossack host leadership. After destruction of the Zaporozhian Cossack host in 1775, in accordance with the order of Empress Catherine II, Holovaty was one of the was on the military service in Russian army. When in 1783 the Empress renovated the host, now renamed as the Voyska Vernich Kazakov, host of the loyal Cossacks, Holovaty was appointed as its leader. <coughs> the host of the loyal Cossacks took part in the Russian Ottoman War and later renamed as the Black Sea Cossack host Chernomorskaya Kazachstvo, got the lands for settlement in Kuban region, present-day Krasnodarsky Krai in 1793 and then it was renamed as Kubanski Kazakh. Krasnodar, uh, there is a monument, it was built in Russian Empire, then renovated in 2010 with uh, Empress Catherine II and uh, Kozak leaders and Holovati is among them. In September 1999, the monument to Anton Holovati was erected in Odessa. So here you can compare uh, the actual portrait of Holovati when he was still alive at the highest point of his career and how he was uh, uh, depicted on this uh, monument, so with uh, naked torso 
with uh, this uh, Kozak actually Janissary scale block, which is absent here, with uh, this uh, huge uh, oriental sharvars or sharovars, etc. So actually, it's not Anton Holovaty; it's uh, rather average uh, Kozak of a stereotypical image of Kozak. Uh, very much uh, devoted to bodybuilding and uh, quite exotic person. When Golovat, uh, most of his life, he was busy with getting land, uh, property, uh, real estate, etc. So he finished his career as extremely rich person. But on the other hand, there are also realms of oblivion. For instance, uh, the Black Sea Cossack host Chernomorskaya Kazachstva. So, I think that most of Ukrainians and many of Ukrainian historians, they are never asking questions uh, about land Cossacks uh, got in the uh, Kuban region. Was it empty space? Was it desert with uh, no man land? Actually not. Uh, here you see this uh, map. Uh, British map from early 19th century, and here you see uh, Cossacks of the Black Sea living, occupying areas to the north of Kuban River. But before, these lands were occupied by the Nogais, these uh, Turkic speaking nomads who were expelled in eastern direction, and uh, nowadays their descendants living in the north of Dagestan. But to the south of Kuban River, you see Cherkassia inhabited with uh, uh, Cherkassians, uh, Kabardinians, and Adygeans. But uh, now, as you know, uh, these uh, Cossacks later they also occupied south part of uh, this Kuban region. How it happened? It happened because of uh, uh, Russian expansion and Cossacks took active part in this military campaign. Many of them were uh, decorated with this medal, Zapakarenia Zapadnava Kavkaza, in 1864. And uh, they also got uh, imperial banner with the same motto, the Atlichia pri Pakarini Zapadnova Kavkaza, and also this beige on their uh, caps with the same inscription. So, actually, these uh, lands were conquered, and most of uh, Cherkessians, this native population, they were expelled in a very brutal way. I just will give you a quotation of Richmond Walter, the Cherkassian genocide published in 2013. Of the course of hundreds of raids, the Russians drove the Cherkessians from their homeland and deported them to the Ottoman Empire. At least 600,000 people lost their lives to massacre, starvation and the elements, while hundreds of thousands more were forced to leave their motherland. By 1864, three-fourths of the population was annihilated. So at least this uh, campaign could be defined as ethnic cleansing, but also as a genocide. So here you see the map of uh, expulsion of Cherkessians to the Ottoman Empire. And Cherkessian diaspora is quite big, like one million persons living in the Middle East and in Europe. In 1992, the Supreme Council of the kabarda balkar Republic passed the bill on the condemnation of the genocide of the Addicts, Cherkassians, in course of the Russian Caucasian War. In 2011, the Parliament of Georgia recognized the genocide of the Cherkassians in the Russian Empire. And the Winter Olympics facilities in Sochi in 2014 were built in areas that were claimed to contain mass graves of Cherkessians 
who were killed in military campaigns in 1860s. Circassians commemorate the banishment of the Circassians from their homeland. Till now, for instance, we see the uh, demonstration in Istanbul also protesting against these uh, Winter Olympic Games in Sochi. And then uh, we see how uh, some Ukrainian politicians use or abuse uh, this uh, topic of Ukrainian Kuban. For instance, member of parliament Oleksiy Vancharenko recently in October 2019 <coughs> declared uh, establishment of uh, uh, some uh, unit in uh, Ukrainian parliament to claim uh, uh, this uh, uh, cultural and social uh, heritage of Ukrainian ethnic lands and uh, Kuban as the main target of this politics. <coughs> so just uh, let me make a small note that every time the Ukrainian politicians claim the rights on the Kuban Cossacks as part of Ukrainian heritage or Kuban region Krasnodarsky Krai, as part of Ukrainian ethnic territory, they recognize Ukraine's responsibility for the genocide of the Cherkessians. So now it's a smaller case because only Georgia recognizes genocide. But what will happen in the next 20 years, 30 years, when many other countries will recognize it? So I mean that uh, Ukrainian politicians have to be more accurate when using historical topics. Do the contemporary Cuban Cossacks consider themselves as Ukrainians? Just let me remind some important events. In September 2003, the Russian side started to build a dam from the Taman Peninsula towards the Ukrainian island Tuzla. The local Cossacks of Cuban host took an active part in the events, claiming back the island to Russia. For instance, uh, the leader of uh, local detachment of Kuban Cossack host, Ivan Bezugli, as you see, absolutely Ukrainian last name, Bezugli, he declared his uh, active part in uh, establishing Cossack presence on, the, on that uh, land under question and he describing that they opposed the uh, Ukrainian riot police Berkut in 2003 and in a strange way in 2014 these Kuban Cossacks and Berkut together as uh, <coughs> friends defended uh, Crimean Peninsula against Ukrainian nationalists. Then the next quotation of this uh, Ivan Bizugli. In 2014 he got this honorary title, Giroi Kubani, because of his taking part in the annexation of Crimean Peninsula. And he uh, declares that the uh, successful reunification of Crimea with Russia could be impossible without uh, Cossacks of Kuban taking part in. Even more, he said openly that last 20 years we did all the efforts to be prepared to this event. And 700 Cossacks only on, of his detachment were awarded with the Russian medal за возвращение Крыма. So then, uh, let me give next quotation of Bezugli. So, for him, in last 20 years, they considered the Crimea as the, in the focus of their activity, as their uh, target, the area of responsibility. And we prepared our Cossacks. We did a lot of <coughs> preparation in the peninsula. We established contacts with Crimean Cossacks and pro-Russian organizations with Orthodox clergy, patriotic officials, etc. 
And so, let me go to the Crimean Cossacks. They emerged uh, right after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1992, when there was some separatist activity in the Crimean Peninsula, then this, the first <coughs> president of Crimean Autonomous Republic, Yuri Mishkov, was elected and he signed the order in 1994 on the Cossacks of Crimea. So, on the one hand, uh, the Cossacks of Crimea were quite loyal Ukrainian citizens, quite loyal members of this agglomeration of Ukrainian Cossack hosts. For instance, you see official report about Crimean Cossacks who took part in the uh, Great Council of Zaporozhian Host in 2011, and you see here the lead leader, Sergei Yurchenko, and uh, his quotations that address to Ukrainian Cossacks. This year we organized International Youth Cossack <coughs> Military Patriotic Camp Tavrida Sech, making reference to Zaporozhsky Sech, which included the uh, series of events on the Lake Donzlav in uh, Eski Kermen and in the village Zuya. So there were three camps and we, we are doing a lot about military patriotic education of our youth and we are also doing a lot of joint work with the Cossacks from near abroad. So, from Russia. So, it's, it's, this quotation was addressed by Sergei Yurchenko to Ukrainian Cossacks in Zaporozhye in 2011. But what happened in reality? For instance, it's a quotation from <coughs> Crimean newspaper Tavrichesky Vesti uh, about the same event in the Lake Donuslav, in the vicinity of Ukrainian Navy base, uh, we began our Cossack initiative, Cossack camp of protest against military training of the NATO in the Black Sea region. And then in accordance with Cossack tradition, the Orthodox priest uh, consecrated this event and then uh, Cossacks and youth, they have opportunity to hear lectures of Russian political scientists and historians, etc., etc. And the uh, leader of this uh, camp in vicinity of Ukrainian Navy base in Donuslav, the same person, this Cossack colonel Sergei Yurchenko. So he declared that uh, this summer, in 2012, this military camp is situated much closer to Ukrainian Navy base in that very place on a beach where ordinarily uh, have took place uh, Desan. So actually what we see, so long before 2014, uh, these Crimean Cossacks, they uh, made to say investigation of the locations, they uh, defined places, they trained uh, young people to be prepared to final annexation. They have no doubts that it will take place in the future. And the, another Cossack military patriotic camp, Tavrida Sech, in the uh, mountain area, uh, you see here young people getting through military training with Russian banner, etc. And then, uh, five years later, the Crimean Cossacks celebrating the fifth anniversary of the Russian Spring. And uh, <coughs> Crimean President Aksyonov <coughs> with the Crimean Cossacks celebrating this event. And then the cooperation with DNR and LNR, how it works. So this cultural exchange between these states with uses of all these Novorossia brands <coughs> and again this uh, patriotic camp in Donzlav. Then uh, Cossacks in the Donbas and 
how they took part in the conflict, so I will give uh, no details. Probably most of you followed the news and you know quite a lot. But uh, getting closer to the Cossack myth, the efforts to replace the Soviet historical myth with the Cossack myth led to the unpredictable outcome in the Donbas. Deconstruction of the Donbas as the industrial heart of the USSR revealed that in the 1920s the region was composed of two parts, former lands of the Yekaterinoslav province and lands of the Don Kozak host, Oblast Voiska Donskova. Before 1918, the lands to the east of Mariupol and Donetsk and to the south of Luhansk were lands of the Don Cossacks. And here again you see this uh, easternmost, uh, this, uh, the lands of Kozak Hetmanat, the land of Sloboda, Ukrainian Cossacks, the land of the Zaporozhian Cossacks, and this empty area actually it's uh, embraced the lands of uh, these separatist republics, DNR, LNR. So, and this fact is used by these separatists to legitimize the establishment of their statehood in 2014. Russian Nezavisima Gazeta in 2004, that is in time of Orange Maidan in Kiev, that the Cossacks of Don, they declared their support and they demonstrated openly that they want to get back the lands of the Don Cossacks, which Lenin gifted to Ukraine. And they sent address to Russia's president, Vladimir Putin. And the same newspaper in 2014, in February. So, the Don Cossacks declare that if necessary, they will help their brothers in southeastern Ukraine and Crimea to stop this political chaos. And their leader, Nikolai Kozitsyn, on the assembly of Don Cossack leaders with 600 Atamans, uh, <coughs> and also Don Cossacks from uh, Ukrainian Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast, they also took part in. So, uh, revival of the Cossacks in Donbas was at the same time revival of Don Cossacks who filled themselves, who actually were united in many ways with Don Cossack hosts in Russia. As you already saw, Russian Cossacks, they are much better organized than Ukrainian Cossacks. The Russian Cossacks, they have uh, clear-cut uh, aims and they are also getting support of Russian state and supporting Russian foreign policy. In 2014 and 15, the Don Cossacks controlled up to 80% of the LNR territory and only 20% were controlled by its self-declared uh, president, but then he destroyed the Cossacks, and so his relations of this Plotnitsky with Cossacks were not so much friendly. And Plotnitsky, in his to say politics of memory, he preferred to use references to the Soviet symbols, not to the Cossacks. One more interesting uh, person, so called. Uh, the main leader of Vernaya Kazachistva, Alexei Silivanov, quite young man who made a uh, fantastic Cossack career. He was uh, in Kiev secretary of the assembly of Orthodox Cossacks uh, under the aegide of uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriarchate and also secretary of some Council about Cossack development under the aegis of uh, Ukrainian government in 2011, 2012. You hear how close he was to the uh, Ukrainian leaders during some official and religious ceremonies. And then Alexei Selivanov in 2014 
атаман верного казачества, ополченец Донбасса. And uh, his recent uh, quotation quite interesting because in comparison to other Cossacks, uh, this young man, he is quite learned, well educated, reading a lot. So he declared that the Cossacks of uh, Lugansk province, they took part in the people's uprising against this Ukrainian junta and he even made reference to Nikolai Gogol. Казачество – это искра, высеченная из груди русского народа ударами бед. So in that way we see this ambivalence of the Cossack myth and we see this imperial dimension of the Cossack myth. He also declared that not only the Russian Cossacks helped Cossacks in Donetsk and Lugansk, but also members of this uh, Верное казачество from other parts of Ukraine, they also took part in these events in 2014 from uh, Zaporozhye and from Kiev. And according to this young man, this Luhansk People's Republic is a unique state because there are real active Cossack military detachments when in Ukraine which declares that all Ukrainians are of Cossack stock, there are no Cossack military detachments. And then uh, all these bureaucratic issues, the Council of Atamans was established in 2019 <coughs> to have contacts with the leader of this LNR Pasichnik, and then the Cossack life is reviving, developing according to Silivanov and their main goal is to unite these lands with Russia. In Donetsk, Cossacks were quite uh, less active in 2014 and because of that they are used in official ceremonies like in that case you see uh, these uh, persons dressed as Cuban Cossacks, I think, on the, on the inaugural ceremony of Alexander Zaharchenko in 2014. And Cossacks or Cossack myth helped to legitimize the separatist regimes through building continuity with the Cossack past of the region. And then this tradition is maintained by the next president, Pushilin, in 2018, again, the Cossacks are present at his uh, official inaugural ceremony. So, we are, their idea is that we are not separatists, but we continue the tradition of Cossack statehood in this lands. And this lands were the lands of Don Cossacks, not of Zaporozhye. And finally, what happened in uh, Ukraine with Cossack myth in the last 5-6 years? So, I can define it as a triumph and erosion of the Cossack myth. On the one hand, we see that the image of Cossack is uh, used in many ways in uh, Ukrainian official politics of memory. Again, this. Uh, building continuity from the Cossacks through Ukrainian uprising army to the contemporary Ukrainian army. And this uh, October 14 religious uh, festivity of Pokrova turned into official uh, military holiday day of the defender of the fatherland and again you see how this continuity built from Cossack to UPA and to Ukrainian army now and how it is used by politicians. And by businessmen. And uh, by other businessmen for advertisement. <laughs> so I call it erosion of Cossack myth because these recognizable images they became more and more sellable.
Now, the last point, commodification of the Cossack myth. In consumerist society, every popular recognizable brand becomes part of marketing. So he, here it's about beer party or cocktail party, <laughs> the famous Ukrainian brands, restaurant Kazachov, Again, it's connected to this day of Cossacks as defenders of Ukraine. Actually, this day, October 14, uh, became uh, analogous of uh, late Soviet February 23, the day of Soviet army. And uh, also images addressed for uh, childs, for younger uh, consumers. You see this image from uh, uh, late Soviet cartoon, Yak Kozaki, How Kozaks, which was uh, quite popular. And uh, now you see modern interpretation of this image in Gordon's with. Uh, <coughs> and uh, also quite interesting uh, Abu Dhabi sketch making reference to Ukrainian diaspora in Abu Dhabi in the Fashion Gulf in the United Arab Emirates. They are also organizing celebrations. And <coughs> see, culinary dimension of the Cossack myth. So, some sweets and uh, uh, these uh, flumesters. Not only sweet, but uh, bitter oats. The images of Cossacks help to sell it. Something <laughs> strange. So for children, the best Cossack with the name of this child. And again for the adult man. Souvenirs for true men on the day of the Ukraine defender. And cookies with uh, Cossacks topic and uh, so actually everything. So how uh, I don't know why Vidvaha Kozaka is uh, going to the bathroom. And the most interesting in this uh, connection, happy birthday, an envelope for money. So if you have, uh, if you are a child visiting your friend and you have no gift, you can uh, give money in the envelope as adults doing in Ukraine. And this envelope is uh, made in the Cossack style. And the last point, the uh, news of the movie market. So just two weeks ago when writing this uh, lecture I found in the news that uh, uh, Ukrainian ICTV TV channel is uh, making uh, uh, this movie about Cossacks with a quite provocative title Cossacks the absolutely false history and the budget of uh, this movie is uh, like 1 million euro and the 50% is financed by Ukrainian state budget. And of course, if there are Cossacks, there must be Stupka. So that time Stupka is a junior. But, so, the last provocative question I am addressing to you is this deconstruction of the Cossack myth. If, if uh, it could be a comedy, does it mean that Ukrainian society <coughs> is adult enough to say uh, goodbye to this uh, idealized image of the Cossacks as uh, true men, true heroes? Thank you for your attention. <coughs>